Hello everyone and welcome to yet another Room for Discussion interview. I'm glad to see all your faces. Today we will be discussing the International Cr Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, also known as the ICTG. The ICTG was established initially with the aim of prosecuting war criminals in the ongoing ethnic conflict between Bosnian, Croat and Serbian um, forces in the um, early to mid 90s. The court was uh, established in The Hague and was there for 20 years until the sentencing of 19 war criminals um, at its ending five years ago in December of 2017. Today's guest studied law in Leiden, after which he started his career as a university teacher. He then started with the ICG as a defense attorney, where he was later appointed as a judge. Um, I'm Kuhn, this is Lois, and a welcome to our guest today, Fons Ori. Well, thank you for coming today. Thank you. So, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Are you looking forward to the holidays? I beg your pardon? Are you looking forward to the holidays? Uh, yes, 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 of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was not thinking about it yet that much, but... Uh. You are an expert on tribunals, um, but some of us and in the audience might not know as much about international criminal law as you do. So could you maybe briefly explain what the difference is between an everyday criminal uh, court case and uh, an interna international tribunal? Uh, I'm now invited to make a, I'm now invited to make a comparison between a case and a tribunal, which of course is for me analytically a bit of a problem. But um, a, a normal criminal case, it, it depends on where you are defending that case. Are you in first instance? Are you talking about the facts, or are you already at the Supreme Court? Uh, where you are dealing with legal issues, etc. So even a normal criminal case is not a uniform thing. Uh, but it's usually it's um, focusing on a violation of the domestic criminal code that could be theft, that could be murder, that could be economic crime, uh, often not in the criminal code. Whereas in international tribunals, you're dealing with a different type of cases. First of all, these are always huge cases because the smaller cases will never be heard by international tribunals, but they focus on a specific type of crime. That is, usually it's war crimes, crimes against humanity, and um, genocide, which people often say is a crime against humanity. Um, now, um, genocide, of course, is, was at the center of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, whereas it was only a smaller part of the cases before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Because the Rwanda problem, to say so, was really a genocide, uh, whereas in the former Yugoslavia, it was a, clearly it was a war in which genocide was committed, but it was mainly crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, so public international law plays an important role when you're talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity, whereas that is less the case in a domestic trial. Though public international law may play a role as well, but then usually in the margin of domestic criminal cases. For example, if you would want to prosecute an ambassador in the Netherlands for a crime he would have committed here, he would invoke his immunity, which is a public international law issue. So not to say that public international law is foreign to domestic trials, but it hardly ever plays a role, and if it plays a role, it's usually marginally, whereas it is, plays a central role in, uh, in the international tribunals. Is that why tribunals were founded as a separate court, rather than to have it as a deviation of regular criminal law? 
No, there are several reasons for uh, for establishing a, a international tribunal. For example, in the former Yugoslavia, one of the main problems was that we had several republics who declared themselves uh, uh, independent, and of course they would not prosecute their own people. Usually, the more serious the crimes are, and if they are committed by government or agents of the government, then it's very difficult to establish a court uh, because you would always fear that it would be influenced by the government. You see, for example, one of the newly established courts are the, um, uh, the, the Kosovo Tribunal, which is a purely domestic tribunal. It's all in accordance with Kosovo law, but Everyone feared that if you would try these cases within Kosovo, that the judiciary would not be sufficiently independent to try their high officials. So therefore, under the guidance of the European Union, they established, but still in Kosovo law, they established a specialist chambers, as they say, so it's part of the domestic judiciary of Kosovo, but one interesting aspect, no Kosovo judges in it, but only judges from abroad. So that court is now also functioning in The Hague, but the main reason was that no one could imagine that you would be sufficiently independent and impartial if you would do that within Kosovo with Kosovo judges. That's one of the solutions for one of these problems, but um, it, it depends very much on where the conflict is situated. What are the reasons to establish such a tribunal? You already mentioned briefly that um, in the case of Yugoslavia, the international tribunal was mainly used to prosecute people for war crimes as opposed to just genocide. Um, and, and crimes against humanity, of course. But what do you feel was the actual aim, in your opinion, of the tribunal? What was it trying to, to get? Um, it's a bit of a sad story, I think. I think that the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was a bit of an easy way out for the international community. No one expected it to work at all. <laughs> Although, finally, it turned out that it has set a new standard and has initiated a new movement in establishing a lot of other courts. But no one expected... I mean, there was, there was an armed conflict ongoing in the former Yugoslavia and no one knew what to do. Uh, militarily interfere? What should we do about it? Well establish a court that will try those who are committing war crimes. I mean, no one expected ever that this, but it, it was a, a kind of a signal that it shouldn't happen or, and, and then surprisingly, it worked. No one would have expected that at the time. Uh, so if that is an answer to your question, what the aim was, the aim was to get rid of your embarrassment of doing nothing. But did it work in a sense of, kind of prohibiting the continuation of the conflict, or do you mean it worked as a way of, for the international community to signal some, some it, sort of stance? You couldn't expect, really, that a criminal tribunal would stop the hostilities. Mm -hmm. And also, that's not what it's aiming at, because hostilities, whether you like it or not, warfare is in itself not criminal, though, though that is changing slightly now. If you wage an aggressive war, that now slowly becomes criminal. Um, we've seen that after Nuremberg, and also if you look at the statute of the International Criminal Court, you see that after a lot of discussions, etc., that finally aggression has been defined and uh, is part of the crimes, but it's still rather complicated to get an aggression case before the International Criminal Court. But war in itself, if you conduct the war in a way which 
follows the rules of warfare, then no criminal court would have to deal with that. Because if I kill another soldier, it, it's not murder. It's, but if I kill him when he is taken uh, prisoner of war, then it becomes a crime. And therefore, if you say, was the aim to make an end to the hostilities? No, because international criminal law is not about the conduct of hostilities. It is about committing crimes in the context of warfare. And of course, what you always wish to happen is that um, if you punish someone, that others will refrain from committing similar crimes. And especially diplomats and politicians expect a lot of that. They say, well, let's make it criminal, let's prosecute the people, and then, of course, it will not happen again. But criminal lawyers know better. It's already for centuries and centuries that murder is a crime. I would not expect that by prosecuting murderers and punishing them, that no murders would be committed anymore. The preventive uh, effect of trials is very limited. Uh, so uh, I'm not too optimistic in that respect. And, and you, <laughs> see, you also see that because in the former Yugoslavia, of course, there was a lot of uh, communications through telephone, etc. And since the tribunal was established already when the hostilities had not ended yet, uh, you hear people talking about this thing in The Hague. Uh, do, you, do you know there is a court in The Hague now? And they were not that much impressed uh -huh. by that court in The Hague. And it certainly did not lead them to stop committing crimes. Talking about context, can you tell us something about the state of the conflict of the Yugoslav wars at the time of the foundation of the ICTG? Did I say something about the type of conflict? Or? No, more at the, at the type of situation that the conflict was in during the time when the court was founded. Uh, of course, the, the, the federal Yugoslavia was breaking up. Slovenia, the first one to separate itself. And that was, I think there were five or ten victims. The war lasted for six days. So that was an easy thing. But especially in Bosnia. Bosnia was a complex state, Bosnia and Herzegovina, because where in Serbia it's mainly Serbs living there, where in Croatia mainly Croats are living there. I'm not saying that there are no Serbs living in, but Bosnia was a really a, a, a melting situation of Muslims, uh, people of Muslim background, uh, Croats and Serbs. And there was certainly, and that certainly has uh, contributed to the conflict, there was quite some fear about the change of demography. Um, every of the three groups were always a bit afraid that they were dominated by a coalition of the two others or even by one of them. Now, at the beginning of the conflict, no, no, it, well, let's say a few decades before, it was approximately one-third, one-third, one-third. But demographically, you could see that the Muslims took a greater part of the number of citizens. They grew to 40% approximately. And of course, that's the reason why, the, especially the Serbian part of the Bosnian uh, population, wanted to be with and stay with Serbia. But if it broke up, then of course there was a, uh, a risk that they would be dominated by the majority of the Muslims and the Croats. At least these kind of feelings were very important at that moment and certainly have uh, the, the wish of the Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina to join with the Republic of Serbia was clear, whereas the others wanted to make Bosnia and Herzegovina an independent state, including one Serbian minority. 
Was there a certain tipping point in the conflict what it, when the United Nations Security Council decided to interfere? What interference by the Security Council do you mean? I've seen a lot of resolutions. Mm -hmm. They said it's getting worse and worse and worse. But there was not that much interference. Uh, as I said before, there was hesitation to really interfere. Of course, at a certain moment, some UN troops were sent there um, in, in several stages of the conflict, but they were mainly monitoring and trying to keep the parties apart. There was no real military interference. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen that, of course, in the drama in Srebrenica in 1995. There was a UN presence, but uh, well, it didn't prevent to happen what happened in Srebrenica. Um, so, and I think it was in this situation that establishing the tribunal was a kind of, uh, yes, uh, well, we have done at least something apart from monitoring. Uh. And because we spoke a bit about Rwanda already, and the Rwandan tribunal and the ICTG were the first um, criminal court cases where people were actually sentenced for genocide. How does one go about proving that someone committed the crime of, of genocide? Um, yes, of course, you have to prove the elements of the crime. And one of the important elements is, and I'm now not literally quoting, but you, the genocidal intent is to destroy a population, to destroy a group. So if you want to attack them, that's not genocide. But there are several ways of destroying a group. You could, uh, for example, kill all the men. If you kill all the men, you'll have no children anymore which are genetically part, directly part of that group. You can also, you can kill the men, you can, uh, you can hold the whole population, you can sterilize the men. It's, it's about... It, it's really about destroying a group. That's the central element of genocide. Uh, whereas war crimes and crimes against humanity can be a widespread attack on a population, but uh, that is not to terminate the existence of a group. And uh, that's the main difference. In the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY has only established for the Srebrenica massacre that this was genocide, whereas, of course, in the Rwanda tribunal, it was totally different. It was clear there that the one group wanted to kill the other group. Yeah. In terms of legal precedent, to what extent were the Rwanda and Yugoslavia tribunals, the convictions there, a landmark for, for precedent? A landmark for the? A landmark cases in terms of legal yes. precedent going forward. Yes. Uh, landmark cases, you could, landmark cases, you could look at them in from various ways. If you're talking about genocide, it was, uh, I think it was since decades and decades, it was the first case where genocide was established. But these are, of course, also landmark cases because for the first time since Tokyo and Nuremberg, you had a court, a truly international court, which established individual criminal responsibility. I mean, before that, it always was in domestic courts, uh, but domestic courts are usually not that very active in, uh, in prosecuting their own people. Uh, that's, uh, but here, international judges, really independent from the whole, from the whole conflict, they established crimes to have been committed, and there had been a dream already since Tokyo and Nuremberg about a truly international criminal court. You had the foundation to establish an international criminal court, which was active for many, many years, but it was. Uh, it was civil society trying to do something, but suddenly in this situation in the early 90s in the former Yugoslavia, there was, 
they had to do something. And for the first time, now they established a court, which had never been done before under Chapter 7 of the, uh, of the, of the um, Charter of the United Nations. So that was already one of the big issues in the first case, is the Security Council, which would send troops somewhere to monitor a situation or to even to intervene, to take measures, to, uh, to restore peace or to prevent war, would establishing a court be one of such measures? As, as Defence Council in the first case, I pleaded that it was beyond the competence of the uh, Security Council to establish such a court because it was it, it was not the type of measures uh, Chapter 7 is hinting at. Uh, so in, in many respects it was it was new to have again international judges sitting on a bench from all countries. Uh, that was new because in Tokyo and Nuremberg it was only the victors the states who had, who, had, who had won the war, who sent their judges there. That's true for, that's true for, for Nuremberg, and the same is true for Tokyo. But we had, for example, one Dutch judge, Bert Reuling. And why was he there? Because the Dutch government could send a judge, because in 1945, the Netherlands uh, East Indies were still a part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So we could send, like India could do that, like mm -hmm. Australia could do that, like uh, many, many countries from the area. So in, in many respects, it, it was a new development. Uh, in, so, so landmark cases, uh, the institution in itself was a landmark, I would say. If you go back to the first case uh, of the ICTJ, you were part of that case as the defense attorney of Dusko Tadic, which is a Bosnian-Serbian politician, uh, which was before you were appointed as a judge. So how did your defense experience impact your legal thinking? I don't know, but I fully understand your question. <laughs> so how did, how did the perspective of being a defense attorney before being appointed as a judge, did that have any impact on the way you approach the court or your legal thinking? Uh, if you look at the difference between the English tradition and the, uh, the I would say, the continental European tradition, <laughs> in England, judges are recruited from the bar. The best barristers will finally, as they say, it will be called to the bench and they'll become judges. Whereas, of course, in the Netherlands, it's more you become Either you are a career judge, you have started immediately after you studies the training in order to be appointed as a judge, or uh, halfway if you have worked in, in, uh, in a company or if you have been a barrister, you can also become a judge. But in England, it's really only those who have experience as barristers will be called to the bench. And that changes, I think, the attitude of a judge. I think the experience to have acted on behalf of one of the parties, whether that's in civil cases or in criminal cases, certainly gives an awareness of the position of parties if you later have to decide on, uh, have to decide on, on, on cases. And you, one of the one of the advantages also is you know all the tricks. <laughs> you know them all, and you are, it's not that easy to... Uh, but you also know the problems of the defense. You also know what a defense needs, and so that you should, as a judge, you should give it to the defense. You should give it also to the prosecution. But I think having been defense counsel certainly helps very much in... Uh, in, in acting as a judge later on. Were there also judges on the court that were on the prosecution side beforehand? Did we have them? Uh, well, if I make the comparison again to England, in England, if you are in private practice, you can act on behalf of the prosecution or on behalf of the defense. Uh, 
so an independent barrister can be called to prosecute a case. Uh, to that extent, I've had colleagues who certainly will have prosecuted cases before. And let me think about the others. Uh, I don't know for sure whether there had been any the former ICC prosecutors. Specifically not. On the ICC. No, I, I, I just can't <laughs> find an example of this moment. It's, uh, but for me, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. When I was defending cases, I once was hired by a company who said our manager in Singapore is, uh, we suspect that he's, uh, he's stealing from the company, etc., etc. He'll, he'll go back uh, to Singapore uh, on Sunday. Um, we just received a report from an accountant. Is there any way you could get him in a prison cell before Sunday? Well, usually I was defending cases, but I didn't, didn't mind at all to, uh, to take care that he really was locked up before Sunday. <laughs> and I think released the Tuesday afterwards, but uh, that's, uh, that's a different bit. So for me, as a good professional, whether you work for the defense or the prosecution should not make any difference. And you spent in total amount of seven years on the court, uh, the ICTG. What is one of the anecdotes that really to this day still stuck by you from, from the Yugoslavia Tribunal? At the beginning, I missed the beginning. Uh, you, you were on, on the tribunal for seven years? Seven years now. No. As a judge? Never. In, in the ICTY? No, I started in 2001, and I had my last case in 2017. That was the case against Mr. Vladic. And since then, I'm still a judge on the roster of the um, Mechanism of International Criminal Tribunals, Residual Mechanism of International Criminal Tribunals, which I'm still doing. And, and in that even greater time yes. that you were a part of, of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. What is, what is a story that still kind of st sticks by you from, from the tribunal itself? Work hard and be very, very, very precise. Especially the first thing in whatever uh, litigation there is, facts. Yes. Try to establish the facts as good as you can. Now, there's a, quite a difference between the... Uh, between the tradition in Dutch courts and the tradition in, I couldn't say international courts, but well, let's say courts abroad. Because do you have a party-driven system in which the prosecution first presents its case and then the defense presents its case? So it's really the parties who present the evidence. Whereas in... Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, it is the court who is the main player at trial. The court examines the witnesses, and if there are any questions remaining, then the prosecution and the defense will do so. But the central role in the conduct of the trial is with the court. Whereas in a... Uh, in a... Um, Anglo-American system, it's, it's the parties who are presenting their evidence. So um, th that makes quite a difference. And now back to your question, because I... <laughs> your question was about If the there's an anecdote that really still, still stuck with you until this an day. An anecdote? Uh, anecdote. Uh, of course, it's... There's not a lot of fun in court. Well, sometimes there is. Uh, I remember that at a certain moment I had difficulty re is reading in something, uh, reading something, and Mr. Mladic offered me his glasses to read <laughs> what I uh, had to read. And, uh, and of course, there are always yeah, anecdotes. I mean, you try to establish an atmosphere in court where... Now and then, a little smile is uh, is possible. However serious the matters are, for example, one of my favorites was uh, 
uh, if the parties also always wanted to have more time to do all kind of things, I said, well, I know two famous songs. The one is yesterday, the other one is tomorrow. I prefer yesterday is the better song rather than tomorrow. Um, well, is this an anecdote? It's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a dusty joke. And, um, anecdotes. Of course, the quite interesting things happened in court. And uh, the, is, there's always a bit of tension between these two systems of letting the parties go and, uh, and it intervene as a judge. Um, because the parties usually take their time. The problem is to already intervene in the early stages. Well, you, you do not allow us to slowly build up our, our line of questioning, etc. And sometimes at the end, you could only establish that I couldn't, I couldn't find out any line of questioning at all. It was all chaos. Um, so, um, but um, I remember a moment that a witness, when we had seen his statement, was suddenly used the word photographs. They were looking at the photographs, and in his statement, there was nothing about photographs. So then you suddenly feel that there may have been shown a photo spread to this witness, and that he had not recognized anyone of the photo spread, and then one of the major sins is to move this all aside, and also, therefore, the fact that he did not recognize persons that were shown to him. You don't even know what photographs, what persons were shown on him in his photo spread. So there, very much unlike the Anglo-American tradition, I... Uh, I thought we have to do something about it. And I noticed that the interpreter who was present during that interview at the time, and again, the report didn't say anything about photographs, was at that moment working in our building. So then I intervened directly and I said, we want to hear a court witness, which is, again, court witnesses, perhaps at the end of the case, but. To, to in the middle of the case to start, and then to have a court witness within half an hour or an hour or in order to prevent that any of the parties could start talking to the potential witness. And then we suddenly had within half an hour, totally against the tradition uh, the, um, of this type of procedure, we, we certainly had a, a, a court witness. And of course, he wants to ask, you were there as an interpreter. Do you know whether any mm. photographs have been shown to this witness? So in order to clarify, and that brings me back to what I said earlier, facts, facts, and facts, again, is the most important thing. Only if these facts are established, beyond a reasonable doubt, you can think about uh, all kinds of legal consequences. And uh, one of my favorites mm -hmm. always has been... Um, forensic science, and I can tell you that if you are interested in ballistics, which hardly ever play a role in a domestic normal case, then all the shelling, etc., with all the projectile trajectories, I loved it. Uh, of course, your background coming from the Dutch system lies within Dutch law, um, and in the past you've claimed yourself to be a Dutch legal pragmatist. <laughs> So, how did you apply this pragmatism to this new system of the ICTG? How did I apply the Dutch? The, the pragmatism of the, of the oh, Dutch system. Yes, yes, I read that again and again, that I'm so pragmatic. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm so pragmatic. Uh, uh, the, the, these cases and these trials can last for many, many years. So trial management is important. And just to give you an example, on uh, first of all, if a uh, council is asking three, four, five, six, seven questions where you think by yourself, 
what direction, where is it going? And then you can say, please, could you come to your point? Put a question to the witness which helps us in better understanding the case. Okay, but to just give you an example of what sometimes happens, there was an issue about an attack on a UN vehicle, and um, that was in the late afternoon, early evening. And then, of course, the issue is, could you see that it was UN vehicle or not? And whether you can see it depends on distance, depends also on daylight. So there was an issue about was it after sunset or before sunset? And uh, then I would always try to cut that short and say, let's have a look at the tables. Of <laughs> we know the date, we know the time, etc. So easy. Let's let's look at the look, let's look at the, uh, at the at the tables of sunset, sunrise. And then I remember that one of the council, when we had a table of I think of 2005, perhaps, or 2010. Was it Jasper? That's 2010. This happened in 1994. <laughs> okay, my God, what are we talking about? If you want to make a serious issue, compare whether there's any summertime, wintertime issue, etc. But don't bother me with saying that the sun and the moon and the earth has changed their practice over the last. 15 or 20 years. At least you should come with a very strong story to argue that. And if you're talking about pragmatism, yes. For me, if you want to know whether there was still daylight, you can even ask for the reports on whether it was cloudy or not, but let's stick to the facts, and that is to be found in those tables. And don't then come up with it was 15 years ago. The Nuremberg trials uh, were hosted in Germany, of course. Uh, on the other hand, with the ICTG, it wasn't necessarily hosted in the region, but in The Hague. Why, why this difference? Uh, first of all, Germany wasn't Germany anymore, when, <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least it was not the same Germany. Let's not forget that the ICTY was established when the conflict was still ongoing. Mm. I mean, w w where to establish such a court in, in the former Yugoslavia. Would you do it in Bosnia or would you do it in Croatia and Serbia? When we started the defense in the Tadic case, the war was still going on. I've been preparing for the defense for the first time in the former Yugoslavia in, I think it was January 1996, immediately after the Dayton agreements, December 1995. But my lead counsel, Misha Vladimirov, he went there already in August, September 1995, when the war was still ongoing. It's not easy to establish a court in, in a war zone. Uh, and of course, that was different in, uh, in Nuremberg, uh, because there, there was now the four powers. You had the Russian zone, the French zone, the British zone, and the, uh, which was the last one, uh, the American zone. So. The country was ruled by foreign powers at that moment, and there it was e more easy to, uh, to to establish a court. By, by the way, you should go to Nuremberg and see the courtroom, mm. and it's a kind of a, a kind of an exhibition there now, also dealing with the past of Nuremberg, and but also the follow-up in the in the modern tribunals. It's uh, it's a famous courtroom. Uh, it was still being used until a couple of years ago for ordinary cases. Oh. The Dutch ended up having quite a strong involvement in the in the conflict in Bosnia and former Yugoslavia, uh, mainly around Srebrenica. <laughs> Always struggle pronouncing that. Um, isn't it somewhat dubious that the trial was continued to be held in the Netherlands, even though the Dutch UN soldiers did have such a a strong presence in the conflict itself? Uh, well, I take it that you're referring to the role of Dutch Bed. Yeah. Yes. Of course, that's only, let, let's say, the emphasis on that involvement of the Netherlands was in 1995. Conflict started 
by far earlier. So it's only part of the conflict where Dutch bed played an important role. Uh, I was recused for dealing with the Mladic case. One of the parties said, you're Dutch. And the Dutch played a role in Srebrenica, so therefore you shouldn't, you're not impartial, you shouldn't deal with that case. Uh, I always said, I'm, I may be Dutch, but I'm elected by the United Nations, and I have no special link with the Dutch or with Dutch bet in that respect. Uh, therefore, I always insisted on being considered to be an international judge rather than that I was of Dutch nationality. Uh, finally, uh, if a party wants to recuse you, there will be a, a decision given either by a special bench, which deals with a recusation, uh, the same as we have in the Netherlands, where we call it the Wrakingskamer. So that is you as the judge who is recused, you, you don't play a role in the decision, you just put your your case before the deciding um, authority. And th this happens, I was accused, I think, five days before the start of the Mladic trial. And um, I think 22 or 23 grounds of recusal were brought against me. And um, I think it, it may not have been a full surprise that it came then, because the Mladic defense had insisted several times that we should delay the start of the trial. And I remember that the, uh, the recusal uh, submission was filed the Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock before the trial would start the next Wednesday. Uh, and it's, of course, clear that as long as there's a recusal request pending, that you couldn't possibly start the trial, really. So, and perhaps now going to back to my pragmatism, mm -hmm. I remember I saw that on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. I remember I had a dinner that evening. I thought, okay, um, let's have that dinner. But before going to dinner, I said to my staff, uh, those who are available over the weekend, I would very much like you to be present tomorrow morning at 8.30, and then we'll start on writing down my position for all the 22 or 23 grounds of recusal. Now, there were nine or 10, which I had been thinking about already many, many times, so it was very easy. But my whole staff worked the whole of the weekend, and I think the last email sent was um, Monday morning, 3 o'clock, so that I could present my paperwork to the president, who had to decide whether he would deal with it himself or whether a special um, recusation chamber or panel should be uh, established. Uh, so that was on his desk at 10 o'clock, and uh, we really worked very hard on that, and, uh, and we did it in such detail that the president was confident to give his decision on Tuesday. So when on Wednesday morning we went to court, start of the trial, I could just say to the party, okay, let's see, did anything happen the last few days? Oh yes, oh yes, there was a request for recusal uh, oh, last Friday. Okay, the, de the president has decided yesterday, so that's not a reason not to continue. But I can tell you that within just a couple of days to do all that paperwork, and it saves a lot of, if, if we, Let's just assume, if the president would have considered it necessary to establish a panel to deal with the recusation, of course, that would have caused a delay of one, two, or three months. And that's all lost time. I'm now talking also about court management. So 
perhaps very pragmatic, but I tried to do my very best to see whether we could prevent that we would further lose time in court by presenting the best possible position paper to the president. And then it was not in my hands anymore whether or not I did my contribution to avoid further delay. And of course, well, a bit of a smile on this Wednesday morning. Has anything happened over the last year? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. So moving away from the Yugoslavia tribunal and more towards today's situation, you can see that 2022 started with war on the European continent for the first time uh, since the Yugoslav wars. And yesterday, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands said that they're exploring options to establish a new tribunal, this time to prosecute acts of aggression from Russia towards Ukraine. Do you think that the current situation in Ukraine warrants such a tribunal? Um, it, it depends on what you expect from a such a tribunal. Um, at this moment, it's clear without any special court or tribunal to be established for that purpose, there's no, uh, at least I don't see any um, tribunal which could establish individual criminal responsibility for aggression. I mean, the Peace Palace, of course, is rather is it's only about states, and apparently we are here talking about individual criminal responsibility. Well, the ICC, as far as you can see, but it's, that's a rather complex story, um, it would finally be impossible to hear any case against Russian individuals, because I'm talking about individual criminal responsibility. Um, I, I don't see there any possibility. So the only way to do it would be by establishing another tribunal or court. Uh, and of course, then it depends on who's going to do that. Uh, the UN, certainly not Security Council, because Russia has a veto power there, so there's hardly any chance that uh, Russia would ever even be hesitant to veto any such a proposal. And everyone knows, so there will never be such a proposal. Uh, could the General Assembly pay, uh, play a role there? Um, certainly, of course, the, the effect of a General Assembly resolution is quite different from a Security Council resolution. Uh, Security Council will bind all states, General Assembly will be not. But of course, it could give some support to states who try to make a joint effort to establish such a tribunal. But so it's it's not easy even to think about how you would establish such a tribunal or court. Uh, but the second thing is, of course, if, if you want to try persons, uh, how to get them? Because in most of the international courts and tribunals, there's no way of having a trial in absentia, so in the absence of the accused. Only the Lebanon Tribunal knows such a procedure, but not before the ICC, not before the ICTY, it, it just doesn't exist. Now, that is not very attractive, as the Lebanon Tribunal has shown, to have trials in absentia. Um, at the same time, uh, if you want to establish individual criminal responsibility for that, even if finally the accused would not appear, which always is a bit of a flaw to the, to the, to the proceedings and to the outcome, because without the input of a defense, a, a judgment is, is uh, well, let's say the opposite. It's really preferable to have the input of a defense before you decide any case, guilty or not guilty. So it, it's certainly a, a second best or perhaps a third best solution. At the same time, uh, you can think of intermediary uh, solutions. We have he, the, had the MH17 trial in the Netherlands where three accused were tried in absentia and were convicted. And where one accused was not present but was represented. And he was acquitted. 
So there are possibilities as well. Let's not forget that the tradition of trials in absentia in the European continent are quite different from uh, the English and, <coughs> and American uh, tradition. Uh, I remember the first case about trials in absentia before the European Court of Human Rights against England. There was something about a judge who said to another judge, I heard about trials in absentia. I did not even know that such a thing exists. Well, whereas half of continental European, especially the Italians, were champions in having trials in absentia. At the same time, in Germany, no trials in absentia at all. So what to think about trials in absentia? To exclude them for the full 100% is not very wise, I think. Uh, but they are certainly not very attractive from a legal point of view. Uh, but what would be the outcome? Some people are disappointed if someone is tried in absentia and is never caught and will never serve his sentence. Uh, yes, at the same time, looking at the MH17 trial, you see that quite a few victims were happy that at least a court established that some people were responsible for what had happened, even if they would finally not end up in jail. And of course, we do not know yet, uh, because uh, if this is the final judgment, I do not know for sure whether it is or not, but they still could be arrested one day and have to serve the sentence or have to first appeal and then being detained in pretrial detention. And so even if the what people want is that the person sentenced really served their, served their punishment, their sentence, that it's not, uh, it, it's, even if that doesn't happen, nevertheless, the fact to have been established by a court may already to some extent satisfy the victims. Uh, so much depends on what to expect, how to organize it. Uh, I'm still thinking about it. Maybe it would be a good time to now also ask the audience if they would like to ask you something. Yes. Yes, of course, go ahead. Is Mr. Milosevic died, you said it was an important day. Uh, I remember that the day after Mr. Milosevic died, he died on a Saturday. Already for a long time it was uh, organized that I would be interviewed in, in uh, Buitenhof, a Dutch uh, television program. And of course the whole, this whole interview <laughs> changed character quite a bit uh, since Mr. Milosevic died the day before. Um, but <clears throat> what we know is, first of all, uh, our accused usually were elderly people. Some of the judges were as well. And some of them had medical problems, as most elderly people more or less have. Now, what we know is that Mr. Milosevic complained a lot about his heart condition and that he was not treated well by doctors in prison uh, because the medication, he said, didn't work. And indeed, the medication did not have the effect one would expect. And then one measure was taken, that was, let's stay with this accused for a while after he has taken his medicine. Let's keep an eye on him for the next hour. And surprise, surprise, the medication worked very well, which at least could suggest that he may not have fully swallowed his medication before. I'm not saying he did not, but at least when they stayed with him for one hour, it was clear that the medication worked better. May have been the impact of the presence of other people, but it could also be that um, the medication stayed within the body of Mr. Milosevic, where 
earlier possibly it had left that body too quickly. Then the next episode, again, the medication is not working well. And then in the context of, of a different diagnostic process, some medication was found in the blood of Mr. Milosevic, which was not prescribed to him by the responsible doctors. It was a medication which is usually prescribed for an illness which was not diagnosed with Mr. Milosevic. One of the side effects of that medication found in his blood was that it undermines the effect of lowering blood pressure medication. Again, how that medication finally came into his blood, I wouldn't know. It is, I think it's fair to at least consider the possibility that that medication was smuggled in and was taken uh, for the purpose of undermining the effect of the medication that was, that was prescribed because that was one of the side effects. Okay. So, therefore, at that moment, uh, people started suggesting that Mr. Milosevic was intentionally trying to create a situation in which he could blame the doctors for not treating him well, so that he could, as he insisted already for quite a while, that he could undergo treatment in Russia. Uh, it was, I think, a couple of weeks after it had been established that Mr. Milosevic died, died of a heart failure. And uh, he, he, had a, he had a heart condition, so that's, that's for sure. Uh, what does it tell us? It does tell us that elderly people can have heart conditions of which they can die. It also tells us that there is a possibility that uh, detained persons try to do everything to get out of the prison cell at that moment. These, I would say, are two short conclusions. Uh, finally, no other, from what I understand, no other cause of death could be established as far as Mr. Milosevic was concerned. I think. Everyone would have wished that he would have stayed alive because you have to stop the proceedings. It was never established that he was guilty of what he was indicted for. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the most important uh, purposes of a tribunal to establish individual guilt of a person who is accused before the tribunal. And that finally didn't happen. So to that extent, apart from it's always to be regretted if someone dies, um, that also for purposes of criminal law, it was regrettable that he passed away before judgment was passed. Is there anyone else who has a question from the audience? Uh, the girl in the back with the sunglasses. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I had a question about the trial of Ante Gotovina, the Croatian general. Uh, seeing that his case was a little bit peculiar since at first he was convicted on eight counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity, but then like a year later he was acquitted of all charges. So I was wondering if you were part of that trial and how common his case was and how come the acquittal came so soon after he was convicted. Well, so <clears throat> Did new evidence come to light, or yeah, just what was the reason for his acquittal so soon after the original trial? I'm somewhat hesitant to uh, talk about the Kotovina case. I was presiding over the trial in which he was uh, convicted. And the appeals chamber, in all its wisdom, five judges instead of the three of us, finally decided that he should be acquitted. Um, 
I'm, I'm not going into the content of whether that appeal judgment, uh, it's the appeals judgment and that's the valid judgment. One comment I would like to make about it, and that is that the appeals judgment was by majority of three judges against two. And if you read the language of the judges who dissented, then I was a bit appalled, as a matter of fact, the language they used. One of them wrote, this has got nothing to do with justice, uh, talking about the majority who acquitted him. Uh, I'm only telling you this to indicate that there has been strong conflict of, uh, of opinions in that case. And uh, I don't think it's wise for a judge who presided over the first instance to now start commenting on the appeals judgment because it would be easily understood as being unhappy with that they overruled me. I mean, that's part of the job. I've been in the Dutch Supreme Court. I've overruled so many other decisions. I wouldn't expect those judges to later uh, tell the world why the Supreme Court had been wrong. So I want to avoid such a position. Okay, I think that that was it for the audience questions. And we have one last question for you, looking even further into the future. There has, have been some calls from climate activists for an international court or tribunal um, for climate-related crimes. Do you think that there is space within in the current kind of system of international law for such a trial? Well, I think important people have promoted that idea. And um, if you consider it a crime to severely damage the interests of others, <coughs> of course, at a certain level, because we are always, all of you, myself included, of course, we are damaging the interests of other people on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, I think we have seen for the first time when Iraq invaded, what was it, the, uh, the, the Iraq war, when they uh, blown up all the oil wells, which created a huge pollution. Uh, uh, that's for me a pretty clear example where certainly considering uh, individual criminal responsibility is worthwhile. Um, if we're talking about uh, damage to the ecosystem either by irresponsibly using uh, fuels or irresponsibly uh, cutting down woods or whatever, uh, <coughs> if this is intentionally done on a large scale then I think it would be worthwhile to consider uh, to consider to make this an, uh, to, to make this a basis for make this a basis for individual criminal responsibility. It's always a bit. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that the whole development of the warming of the earth, or uh, in other ways damaging the ecosystem. Of course, it's, it's, it's usually not one person who does it. Uh, but that's perhaps something which is typical for the development of criminal law over the last, well, let's say, 50 to 70 years, that in earlier days, one person would steal from a, one other person. One person would kill another person, whereas organized crime, of course, is already an organization which uh, intentionally damages the interests of other other people. Uh, here, you also can imagine that, uh, for example, a, a company acts totally irresponsible uh, in relation to cutting woods or whatever, and that the solution we found normally for economic crime that is to find the culpable persons within the organization and to make them also criminally responsible 
for what happened there. I can imagine that this would also work in the, in, in crimes against the uh, natural environment. So it's certainly worthwhile uh, to consider it. And uh, I don't know whether if you read, better if you read the book East Street, West Street. I've uh, forgotten the name of the author, but a famous English uh, lawyer. He's very much a promoter of this idea as well. That, uh, so it's worth our consideration. <laughs> I think uh, that is a good note to end today's interview on. Can we have one last round of applause for our guest today, Alphonse Ori? <laughs> To our audience, thank you for coming. This was the last interview of this year. Next year, we'll be starting uh, the 23rd of January with an interview with the CEO of Fairphone, Eva Gauwens, and the day after with an interview of Amnesty International's director of the Netherlands, Dagmar Oudshoorn. We wish you lovely holidays. If you get bored during the break, you can watch our interviews on YouTube or listen to them on Spotify. Thank you for joining us this year, and we hope to see you in 2023.